This plane behind me is where the legendary leader Hannibal hurled the army of Carthage against the might of Rome in 216 BC. I'm Matthew Settle. Over 100,000 men fought in a battle to the death. Over half of them died here in Cannae. Today, this land is part of Puglia in southern Italy. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like then. But now, with new video game technology, you are about to see this great battle as never before. The vast numbers of soldiers, the troop formations, how they fought, and how the battle was won. Get the view the generals wish they had. Now, on Decisive Battles. This is all that remains of the Roman town of Cannae. But 2,000 years ago, these fields saw Rome's mighty legions battle against one of the greatest military minds in history, Hannibal, commander of the armies of the great trading city of Carthage. By 250 BC, Rome had made itself master of all Italy. Now it wanted to expand and to control the Mediterranean Sea but it had the wealthy city of Carthage on the north coast of Africa to contend with. The problem wasn't that the Mediterranean was too small for two rival powers, but the problem was that Carthage had designs on Sicily and Spain, and Rome had designs on North Africa. For 24 years, the two great powers fought a bloody war for control of Sicily. Carthage was defeated and Rome imposed crippling terms for peace. Hamilcar, the Carthaginian general in Sicily, was furious. As sacrifices were being made to the gods, he brought his nine-year-old son to the altar and made him swear an oath, never to be a friend to the Romans. That young boy was Hannibal, and he never forgot his promise. When Hamilcar died, power passed first of all to his son-in-law, Hasdrubal, and then when Hasdrubal himself was assassinated, it passed to his son, Hannibal. Carthage is now in debt. It's got to pay the Romans off money every year. It's lost a lot of its territory, so they decide to create a very solid, very wealthy province in Spain, and also a very strong army. Rome was worried by the recovery of Carthage and was just waiting for an excuse to strike again at its old enemy. When Hannibal attacked a Spanish city, Loyal to Rome, they saw the perfect excuse to go to war. But Hannibal decided to attack first. Hannibal works out that the, the only way to defeat Rome is to go right to the center, to go to Rome itself, go to Italy, and beat the Romans there. Hannibal's strategy is one of the clearest cases in history of attack being the best form of defense. In 218 BC, he began his march north through Spain with an army of 100,000 men. 37 elephants. Then Hannibal did the unthinkable. He crossed the Alps into Italy in the dead of winter. Hannibal is an immensely charismatic leader. Hannibal could get armies to do things that most men simply couldn't have dreamed of. Somehow an army with Hannibal in command could go that little bit further. He was still a young man, only in his 20s. But his hatred of Rome drove him and his army onwards. The Romans got their first taste of Hannibal at the Battle of Trebia. And now with new video game technology, we will be able to see Hannibal in action as never before. The importance of elephants shouldn't be underestimated. They were never used as pack animals, they were only used as weapons. And they were very important for his image. We know of coins that uh, we still have, in fact, coins uh, with the image of Hannibal on the one side and an elephant on the other. The Roman legions were crushed by Hannibal and his war elephants. The next year, it was the same story. Rome sent a second army and suffered a second defeat at Lake Trasimene. Nothing, it seemed, could stop Hannibal. He 
His army rolled on south through Italy and rested here on the Adriatic Sea. Hannibal was now less than 100 miles from Rome. He had already killed or wounded 100,000 legionaries. In desperation, the Romans decided to gamble everything on one great battle. They committed eight legions, 70,000 men. The Romans decided that they were going to go for broke. They were going to create a massive army, twice as big as anything that had faced Hannibal before, and simply smash him. On August 2nd, 216 BC, the huge Roman army met Hannibal, here, near the town of Cannae. It would be Hannibal's genius against overwhelming odds. It would be the bloodiest battle the ancient world had ever seen. The hot wind blows off the plain of Cannae, just like it did 2,000 years ago. But then the fields were uncultivated and home to the two most powerful and different armies of the ancient world. At stake, control of the Mediterranean and the future of Rome itself. Let's take a closer look at the huge Roman army which opposed Hannibal. It contained eight legions, each had up to 5,000 men, drawn into three lines, which were in turn divided into squares of infantry. This checkerboard formation was designed for maximum flexibility, but it was tricky to operate in the heat of the battle and needed a very experienced commander to make it work. As a Roman soldier, just where you stood in these three lines was based on your age and your experience. If you were around 17 to 25, you would take up position right here in the front rank. Here you would be in the thick of the action. As a raw recruit, you would become battle-hardened or die. If you survived to your mid-twenties, then you would graduate to the second rank of experienced men at the peak of fighting fitness. And if you lived to be a grisly old veteran, you would find a home here in the third rank. Maybe it wouldn't be so quick anymore, but all that knowledge and experience would help get the army out of a tight spot. Let's take a look at what Hannibal and his army would have seen. The skirmishers out in front act like a kind of curtain, making it difficult to work out just how the Roman troops are organized, and how many there are. And we can see that Hannibal's army is nothing like the Roman military machine on the other side of the battlefield. This is an army drawn from many countries. From Africa come the Libyan spearmen, and Numidian cavalry and small swift horses. There are Gauls from France and Spaniards fighting both on foot and on horseback. Here, Hannibal has the advantage of 10,000 horsemen against the Romans 6,000. And the flat plain of Cannae is perfect for cavalry warfare. But he has only 40,000 infantry against Rome's force of 70,000. The Roman army was so vast it had two commanders, Paulus and Vero. They took turns leading the army on alternate days. Now this is tricky enough if both commanders have the same strategy, but they didn't. They had competing strategies. Paulus favored a cautious approach and did not want to rush into battle. Vero was spoiling for a fight and wanted to force the battle onto the open plain where the huge Roman army had room to maneuver. On August 2nd, 216 BC, it was Vero's turn to command. And so the Roman army began to form ranks for battle. As usual, the infantry occupied the center, with the cavalry detachments on either wing to guard the flanks. We can never know exactly what was going through Vero's mind, but he decided to change the normal battle order. He ordered the Roman ranks to be made much deeper. There were fewer gaps and hardly any option to change formation. Either through great wisdom or utter folly, the consuls had agreed to stack the legions to create depth and shock with the idea they could just burst through the Carthaginian army. They'd given up flexibility in exchange for power. And so Hannibal devised a trap. Massed his Gauls and Spanish troops in a crescent formation that curved outward towards the Roman lines. He seemed to be inviting an all-out attack 
on his outnumbered force. Even his own soldiers must have wondered what he was up to. He had placed himself at the most vulnerable part of the line, at the center where the fighting would be fiercest. They had to hold the advance of this huge Roman steamroller. He was there to encourage what he knew to be the weakest part of his line. To some extent, he may have been appealing to the sort of emotional, the warrior culture of the Gauls in particular, who made up a lot of these units. This was a culture in which you were supposed to excel, do the spectacular, to stand out in front. Strangely, Hannibal had left his best troops, a Libyan spearman from North Africa, in reserve on the flanks of his army. But Hannibal knew exactly what he was doing. He had a plan. Almost 130,000 men and 16,000 horses were squeezed into this battlefield just over two miles square, beginning where the tree line marks the river and ending here at the Hill of Cannae. Suddenly, there was a frenzy of movement. The skirmishers ran forward. Legions advanced in step. The men of Carthage, outnumbered two to one, braced for impact. Battle of Cannae had begun. Hannibal sent his heavy cavalry straight for the Roman horsemen under Paulus. The fighting was fierce and brutal. Meanwhile, Hannibal's Numidian cavalry charged the Roman left wing under Varro. While the cavalry battled, the eight legions of Roman infantry rolled forward towards Hannibal's position. When they got to within 15 yards, each legionary threw his spear, the Pila. Then they drew the gladius, the short stabbing sword of hardened Spanish steel, and collided with Carthaginian Crescent. This is a replica gladius and shield. The shield was used for battering an opponent, quickly followed by a thrust. The shield alone weighs 22 pounds. So, in this heat with that sun and a full suit of armor, it's hard to imagine fighting for four minutes, let alone four hours. Modern reconstruction of weapon efficacy tell us that a muscular man with a gladius can wield more thrusting power, more killing potential than a spear or an arrow or any other ancient handheld weapon or missile. The sheer weight of Roman numbers was irresistible. Hannibal suffered dreadful losses as the legions hacked their way deeper into the center. The Roman juggernaut seemed unstoppable. Hannibal and his men were hanging on by the skin of their teeth. Defeat seemed inevitable, but Hannibal was about to spring his trap. Carthage and Rome are fighting for supremacy in the Mediterranean. Things were looking desperate for Hannibal as his men were hacked down all around him. And the legions were pounding into his army like a battering ram. For the Romans, it seemed that one more push would lead to victory. But they were blind to the growing danger all around them. Now it became clear why Hannibal had adopted the crescent formation. As the Roman advance was sucked into the center of the crescent, the Libyan spearmen on the flanks wheeled round from both sides to catch the Romans in a vice. People in a very 
center of this mob couldn't use their weapons. They were pelted by spears, javelins, stones, but they could not reply backwards. It was too compact, it was too tight. The Romans are a big crowd. It's like people streaming out of a football match. They can't see what's going on. At that moment, Hannibal's cavalry smashed through the Roman horsemen on both flanks and began to move around behind the legions. At the front, the Roman attack became bogged down because of its densely packed formation. At the back, the Carthaginian cavalry closed in. The trap was sprung. The vast army of Varro and Paulus was completely encircled. Had they kept their wits about them, they could have had an organized breakout and still rescued the battle. So what happened? Fear happened. Emotion happened. Panic was a matter of spirit and a land and fear and all of those other emotions that explain why one side wins and one side loses. Both of the Roman commanders were in the thick of the action, commanding cavalry detachments. Paulus, who had never wanted this fight, was knocked from his horse. He sat down on a rock, nursing a head wound. His officers urged him to leave as Hannibal's army was just moments away. He refused, and seconds after they left, died in a hail of javelins. And Varro, who had been so keen for combat, he escaped back to Rome and was forgiven for his defeat. No matter how unwise Varro's decisions might seem in retrospect, to the Romans at least, they're not going to criticize him because the, the great trait of all Roman commanders is aggression. You gotta remember that at Cani, what happened should not have happened. Military strategists could not envision that a numerically inferior army could surround in a concentric manner on both sides a numerically superior force. So the very idea that someone like Hannibal could pull that off was just audacious and should not have happened. By nightfall, Cani was a field of blood and tangled limbs. The actual fighting had only taken four hours, but nearly 50,000 Romans and 10,000 Carthaginians were slaughtered. That's roughly 200 men each passing minute. Nearly one-third of all Roman senators, the men who governed Rome, lay slain or captured. This was the worst defeat ever suffered by Rome. Cannae seems almost the perfect victory. A smaller but much better army takes on a very big, very strong opponent, and on an open plain, there's no ambush, there's no surprise, Hannibal, just by using his own skill and the quality of his men overcomes this greater army and doesn't just overcome it, he virtually destroys it. News of the defeat terrified Rome. The city was now at Hannibal's mercy. But he refused to march on it. His generals just couldn't understand. The way was now open. Why not finish off the Romans once and for all? The answer may simply be, in part, exhaustion. Hannibal's fought the hardest battle of his life, he's lost a lot of his friends, he's lost a big chunk of his army. But even more importantly than that, marching straight on Rome would have been a big gamble. He didn't have the sort of army that could have coped with besieging Rome, starving it into submission or directly assaulting it. He didn't have the force to do that. Instead, Hannibal led his army around Italy for the next 14 years. Too weak to conquer Rome, too strong to be defeated in battle. He'd struck three hammer blows to the heart of Rome, and still she had not fallen. Her revenge would be terrible. A revitalized Roman army attacked Carthage. Hannibal was summoned back to organize the defense, but was defeated at Zama in North Africa. He was forced into exile. But still Rome pursued him. Finally, in what is now Turkey, he took his own life, 
poisoning himself to avoid Rome's assassins. Hannibal was 63. The Romans thought they were rid of him for good, but he lived on in legend. Hannibal was one of the great boogeymen of the Romans. Nurses for, for centuries after used to say, Hannibal will get you uh, to, to frighten the children. It's a figure that enters deep into the Roman psyche, the uh, big bad wolf type of thing. Hannibal is there. Hannibal is someone who almost appears like an elemental force, who bursts across the Alps, scatters Roman armies to all sides, and takes Rome to the very brink. Hannibal had kept his oath to his father and his gods, but in failing to destroy Rome, he succeeded in making it stronger. The Romans learned a bitter lesson and reorganized their armies. Within 50 years of Hannibal's death, they would wipe Carthage from the map, plow up the ground on which it stood, and sow the earth with salt. But they could not wipe out the memory of Cannae. Hannibal had written that in Roman blood. <laughs> 